This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. On September 20th, 2017, record smashing Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. Thousands died because of it. New science confirms the devastating rains and floods during Maria were far more likely due to climate change. According to recent data from the U.S. Census Bureau, after the storm, about 4% of the population of the island fled for the United States mainland. They are among the new American climate refugees, joining those from Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina. The new paper is titled Extreme Rainfall Associated with Hurricane Maria Over Puerto Rico and Its Connections to Climate Variability and Change. We have reached the lead author, Dr. David J. Keelings, Assistant Professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Alabama. From Tuscaloosa, David Keelings, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hi, thanks for having me. Just eight days before Maria struck, you and your co-author, Jose Hernandez Ayala, published research on extreme floods and tropical cyclones in Puerto Rico. What got you studying that even before the big disaster struck? My co-author is actually from Puerto Rico. He grew up there, and so he still has family there, and um, his wife's family are from there. So he's very much still in in touch with with people on the island, and we both have an interest in extreme events, and particularly precipitation, especially out of hurricanes. So we got together. We both um, actually overlapped for a while in graduate school, so we knew each other and um, yeah, decided to look into what was going on in Puerto Rico. It's a very interesting place climatologically because it's, I mean, it's a very small island, but it has a very disproportionate amount of, of very high flows, um, high river flows. Um, most of the really extreme flows that are recorded for the entire United States are coming from Puerto Rico and Hawaii, you know, two tropical islands that get huge amounts of hydrologic variability in their in their response to, to rainfall. So it's, uh, it's an interesting place to look at. Would you say the people of that island were relatively adapted to heavy rainfall before Hurricane Maria struck? Uh, you know, I, I, I suspect so. I've, I've, never, I've never visited, but historically they're, they're no stranger to very extreme variability in, in rainfall and in, in flooding events. Most of their, their basins, their rivers can go orders of magnitude and, you know, variability in terms of their flow almost, almost overnight. They're, they're very used to huge um, changes in their hydrology. David, what made the rains of Maria so exceptional? Well, um, that's what the paper was looking at. We so the, the the first thing that we did was we well, we basically had three questions that we wanted to answer. The first one was um, how unusual was Maria in the in the climatology and the history of the island going back to the beginning of the record that we had, 1956, which is when we kind of have reliable data back to. Um, and so we wanted to know, was it really unusual? We find out that, that it was. It, it's a lot heavier precipitation than any other hurricane event that's impacted the island in the last, you know, 60-some years. Um, and not just it, it, not just that it's the highest, but also it's, it's significantly higher than anything that's happened before, 30 to 60 percent, depending on what metric you're looking at, but 30 to 60 percent higher than previous storms like Hurricane George's in, in 98 and um, Tropical uh, Storm Isabel, um, too. It's, it's so much higher than these other events. Um, and then the, the second thing that we wanted to ask was, is something like Maria's magnitude of precipitation, is that becoming more likely through the record? Um, and what we found was it is becoming much more likely from the 1950s to, to today's climate. Um, it's become about three times more likely to happen in the climate of today versus at the beginning of the record. And then, and then finally, we wanted to, and this comes back to your question, we wanted to get at this question of what is causing this change and what can we attribute this increased likelihood of this kind of event in Puerto Rico to? Is it part of natural cycles of variability or is it is it part of uh, a longer term trend i.e. climate change and so we we went about that using a, a fairly complex statistical methodology where we 
essentially look at the climate at the beginning of the record. We look at the climate of 2017 when Maria happened, and we estimate probability of Maria in these two settings. But we then construct a, a what we call counterfactual reality. We construct a a world that that never was, a world that has all of the natural variability that was present in 2017 when Maria happened, but the one thing that we change that makes it not reality anymore is we dial back climate change to what it was in the 1950s. So things like global atmospheric temperature, we dial that back to 1950s. We dial back the, the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. We dial back the sea surface temperatures. We dial back the CO2 in the atmosphere. And then we re-estimate the probability of something like Maria's rainfall happening. And then we can compare those probabilities to each other. And when we do that, so we're isolating the impact of, of human-induced climate change by doing this, we find that Maria's rainfall is actually five times more likely in the climate of today under climate change, under the human influence on the climate, versus what it was in the 1950s without as much human-induced climate change. So... Um, you know, to say that, that a hurricane like Maria is caused by something is, is is very difficult to do, and you should be very, very careful of that. What, what we are able to do with attribution science these days, and attribution science is a relatively new field, but what we are able to do is estimate changing likelihood, changing probability or risk of events um, happening. And what we're able to say with something like Maria is, it is X times more likely because of long-term trends associated with climate change. And again, what we found is it's now about five times more likely. So does that mean that Puerto Rico and the Caribbean should experience more big storms like that sooner than we would have otherwise thought? Well, again, we can't really say that climate change is causing uh, hurricanes. Hurricanes are Chaotic events, um, they're random events, they're extreme events, and they're happening in a, in a chaotic global atmosphere. So in any, in any year, there's the chance that you will have hurricanes happening. But again, they're, they're random events, and there's many natural processes that cause more, fewer or, or more hurricanes in any given year. What we're saying is that when a hurricane does form, when, when those random chaotic conditions are just right and a hurricane gets going, in a warming climate, that hurricane is more likely to intensify, it's more likely to become a higher category hurricane, and it's more likely to do that at a faster pace. It's more likely to go from a category one to a two, three, four, all the way up to five much more quickly. So it's more likely to spend a longer part of its lifespan at a higher category and be more intense. And when it moves over land, um, it's likely to drop more rainfall when it when it's moving over the land. There's also a lot of research out there that's saying now that hurricanes under climate change are moving slower. They have a what's called slower translational speed. So if you imagine a hurricane coming over the top of you and it's dropping all of that rain, it's really bad if it if it's moving slower because then it spends longer over the top of you and it drops more rainfall at your particular location. So under climate change, all of these things are uh, are likely to change in hurricanes. They're likely to be more intense, uh, intensify more rapidly, spend longer part of their lifespan at higher intensity, and also to drop more precipitation. These are all things that are have been theoretically known for, for decades now. If you asked an atmospheric scientist or a climate scientist 40 years ago, what would happen if we warmed up the planet? What would happen if the air temperature increased? What would happen if the sea surface increased? What would happen if because of that the atmosphere can hold more moisture? And you said to them, what's going to happen if a hurricane forms in that kind of climate? They would tell you, oh, it's going to intensify faster. It's probably going to spend longer at a higher category, and it's also going to drop more rainfall. These are things that are no surprise based on our scientific, physical understanding of, of what hurricanes do. Um, but now with attribution science, we can actually say, okay, these things that we that we have always known are likely to happen, we can now say that they are happening, and we can attribute it to something like climate change. So that's what's particularly exciting in, in the field at the moment. 
Um, so yeah, going back to your question about the Caribbean, you know, we can't say that more hurricanes are necessarily going to happen, um, but we can say that when one does happen, if it interacts with an island in the Caribbean, it's probably going to be a higher intensity hurricane than it would have been otherwise, and it's definitely going to drop more rainfall than it would have done otherwise. Science warns we should expect about 7% more water vapor in the air for every one degree of ocean warming. Now, a new report from the World Meteorological Organization says in 2018, the heat content of the upper levels of the ocean were the highest ever recorded. I'm wondering, maybe will we see a new scale of hurricane rains, maybe off the scale? Do you think we'll need a Category 6 designation for the coming storms? Yeah, you know, um, possibly some some researchers have um, have hinted at that that that's a possibility that again hurricanes are likely to intensify faster and and they're likely to spend longer at those higher categories. You know, I think that there is a physical upper limit. There, there there's a bound there. You, you you know you can't go too much off the scale in terms of hurricanes. There is a, a thermodynamic limit that they, that they will reach. But I think it's I think it is highly likely, yes, that hurricanes again when when the conditions are right and one does happen, um, it's likely that it's going to spend longer as a, as an intense hurricane, a category four, a category five, and perhaps even wind speeds that are edging to the you know upper limits of category five. It's likely to spend longer um, with those kinds of conditions, and it's certainly likely to drop more precipitation because there's. Just as you said, every one degree Celsius that we warm up, there's more moisture in the atmosphere. The hurricane is working with that more moisture, and it's able to convert that into rainfall. Just out of curiosity, is there a name or a a definite level for that thermodynamic limit to the power of hurricanes? Uh, You know, that's that's not really something I study. Wouldn't like to hazard a (laughs) hazard, I guess, on that. But I'm sure that from what I read, that yes, there is a. So there's a limit that hurricanes can reach, yes. All right. You, in your paper, also talk about other factors that can beef up wind speeds and the amount of water carried in hurricanes in the mid-Atlantic region. You talk about the El Nino-La Nina balance or the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Were those factors in Maria, as far as you know? Well, yes. Um, so what we did was to look at our attribution statement again. We're looking at the climate as it was in 2017 with all of these natural influences. And then we're comparing that to the climate uh, sort of counterfactual reality of 2017, but dialing back the longer term trends that are associated with climate change. So as we do that, we keep uh, North Atlantic Oscillation, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, El Nino. Uh, we keep all of those things in there. And so we didn't look at those natural factors directly, other than when you look at the paper, we do say that in observational record, the probability of something of Maria's magnitude of precipitation has gone at the beginning of the record in the 1950s has gone from about a 300-year return event down to about 100-year return event in the climate of today. And and so as you you know, but I'll I'll go over this briefly, as you know, a a return period is an estimate of probability. So people have often heard of the 500-year flood or the 100-year flood. This is a statement of probability. It does not mean that a 100-year flood happens this year and it will not happen again for 100 years, there's a probability of it happening in every single year. A 100-year flood just means that in any given year, there's a 1% chance of it happening. Um, And so we went from a 300-year event, so that's a chance in any given year of about 0.3%, to down to a 1 in 100-year return period event, so that's a 1% chance. So that's about a three times increase in the probability of Maria happening when we just look at the observational record. Now, when we did our attribution study as part of this, what we found was about a five times increase in the likelihood of Maria's precipitation when we isolate the effects of climate change alone. So there's a discrepancy there between the three times increase in likelihood that we found from the observational record versus the five times increase that we found when we 
attribute that change to climate change alone. So that suggests to us that that discrepancy between the five times and the three times increase in likelihood has to do with natural factors like ENSO, like NEO, like AMO, actually counteracting the effect of climate change to some extent. So we can probably say with some certainty that natural factors should actually reduce the effect of climate change in the instance of Maria as it was in 2017. So in other words, if only climate change was acting on increasing the likelihood of Maria, Maria should be five times more likely, but it's only three times more likely. So that means that El Nino and NEO and AMO actually reduced that likelihood a little bit. So they are actually favorable for, for reducing the intensity of Maria in 2017. Thank you for explaining that. I had not heard that before. You are listening to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. Our guest is Dr. David Keeling from the University of Alabama. We're talking about extreme rains from the new breed of climate-enhanced hurricanes, or at least the probability of that happening. Now, David, closer to your home state of Alabama, or now it's your home state, I guess, a report released in April by NOAA and the National Weather Service upgrades Hurricane Michael to Category 5, and that joins only three Cat 5 hurricanes to make landfall in the continental United States. Michael smashed Florida in the panhandle on October 7, 2018. Did you feel the effects of that storm in Alabama? Yeah, we did. Uh, we did to some extent. I'm in Tuscaloosa, which is is more kind of in northern Alabama. So we're uh, we're about four hours away from the Gulf of Mexico. If you if you were to drive it, so we we didn't feel a huge impact up here, but certainly in southern Alabama they did, and round about uh, as you said, the Panhandle in Florida. By the time it was further north, we were we got some wind and we got some rain, but it was it was not a severe impact like they had in the Panhandle. There's a bunch of new studies out on Hurricane Harvey and the increased risks of extreme rains hitting the U.S. Gulf Coast. And one study found, and I'll quote Dr. Jeff Masters here, climate change made Hurricane Florence's most intense rains over North Carolina in 2018 more than 50 percent greater in magnitude than they would have been otherwise. David, what do you make of this burst of new science and the pattern coming out of it as warming develops? Well, I, I, you know, I think it's all it's all very interesting. I think that most of these studies, including my own, I mean, they've been conducted by independent researchers, and and in many ways, we we use varied techniques and varied data sets to look at these things. And I think it's interesting that all of these studies are are independently finding very similar results. We're all finding that the rainfall being produced by these these high category storms is, is increasing um, significantly, and also we're all finding that we can attribute that increase in in rainfall intensity to climate change. And so this is very very interesting. It's 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 something again that theoretically we've known for from several decades, but now we're actually able to say, okay, we're seeing this happening, and we can actually say with some certainty that climate change is playing a role in the increased precipitation that we're seeing. A few years ago, you did some interesting research into increasing heat waves expected in Florida as climate change develops. What should people there expect? So, yeah, we we looked at um, the likelihood of heat waves. Heat waves are uh, very difficult to to define. Um, There are many different definitions of, of what constitutes a heat wave, Ever just about there's just about as many definitions of a heat wave as there are studies on heat waves, but um, we looked at uh, extremely high daily maximum temperatures, also co-occurring with very high nighttime minimum temperatures. Because if you look at the public health and, and epidemiology literature, health professionals are concerned about not just it being really hot during the daytime hours, but also it remaining hot over nighttime hours so people don't get a sort of chance to recuperate during the nighttime when, when normally it would cool down. If it stays hot at night, it's, it's bad news as well as it being hot during the daytime. So we looked at, um, we looked at what's called a bivariate um, approach to heat waves where we looked at the maximum and the minimum. And what we found is that in the last or most recent 25 years, 
um, of, of temperature records in Florida, we see this increasing likelihood of heat waves, not just in terms of the frequency or the number of events that have occurred, but also we're seeing changes in the duration of those events, so how long a heat wave will last for. Obviously, the longer a heat wave goes on, the more chance that more people are going to be impacted by it. And also, we found that the magnitude of the events are increasing generally when heat waves are happening in the most recent 25-year period, we're seeing that they're, they're more intense heat waves. And then also we found, interestingly, that the timing of events is changing through the year. Um, heat waves are happening earlier and earlier in the summertime. And that's particularly concerning because heat waves and their impact on people has a lot to do with people's acclimatization to heat. When a heat wave happens later on in the summertime, people are already acclimatized to those warmer temperatures. They're used to it. They're already in summer. They know it's hot out and their bodies are more adjusted to it. So when heat waves are changing their timing in the year and happening earlier, it's going to catch people out when people are not acclimatized to those really high temperatures. So suddenly you hit people in the springtime with a really bad heat wave, then it's going to impact more people. And it also has a big effect on agriculture. I've lived in Florida before, and I know that all of that timing really matters to the people who are producing a lot of the nation's agricultural products. Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, heat waves put a huge stress on crops, and, you know, particularly in the in the summertime in, in, in places like Florida, it's already hot. If you have a heat wave, typically heat waves are also accompanied by clear skies, lack of rainfall, um, and so you're really stressing the crops with a, with a really intense temperatures that, that wilts the crops, but also a lack of rainfall so they don't get any evaporative cooling and they also, you know, they don't get any um, replenishing of their, of their soil moisture, so it's, it's particularly stressful for plants. David, what are you working on next and in your field of interest? What critical science do you think could tell us more? Well, I'm uh, I'm currently working on a project to look at um, heat waves across the continental United States. We're um, kind of taking a, a somewhat novel approach in that we're looking at heat waves much more spatially. We're thinking about them um, more as as geometric shapes or blobs, if you will, on the landscape, because we already know fairly well in the literature this has been. Uh, observed for a long time now, and, and, and we're, we're very certain of this in the science, is that heat waves generally globally are becoming much more frequent, much higher in their magnitude, much more intense and longer duration. This is something that, you know, for example, the IPCC talks about in their reports that we're very, very certain that heat waves are, are increasing in these ways and likely to continue to increase um, in magnitude, intensity and frequency. Um, as we as we move forward under a change in climate. And so what we're trying to do is actually look at heat waves um, and think about their size. So we know that heat waves, like I said, are becoming more frequent and higher in their magnitude, but we, we've not really known when a heat wave happens, is it becoming bigger? Is it larger? Is it, is it affecting more people over a larger area when it occurs? And has that got anything to do with climate change? Is it some sort of manifestation of a warming climate on the land surface to affect the size and shape of heat waves? So that's kind of what I'm working on right now to look at, okay, we know more are going to happen, but are they going to be bigger <laughs> in terms of the aerial extent? So, so yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of interesting work going on in the scientific community at the moment in terms of climate science. I think that the attribution work that, that I've been involved with to some extent and what so many other um, independent groups are working on is highly exciting. This ability to, to now uh, answer uh, sort of what the public may be wondering about. You know, the public thinks about climate change and always after a, a storm or a heat wave, there's always questions of, was this caused by human-induced climate change? And we still can't say if any one particular event is caused by climate change. Was it a physical mechanism that caused it? We can't say that. But what we can say is how much more likely these sorts of events are now than what they used to be. And we can also say 
how that likelihood is likely to change moving forward. And I think that this is something that's very powerful. It's very useful for people to know. Um, and I think it's it should be something that that influences um, policymakers. Hopefully. We have been talking with scientist David Keelings from the University of Alabama, and you can find links to this paper about climate change and the deadly rains of Hurricane Maria and all the hurricane news we've been discussing in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. David, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. You're very welcome. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.